What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of Outside the Clutch. I'm here with Mr. Dave Levinson of Custom Scales. How's How it you going, been, buddy? Always good. Always good. Awesome. So one of the things I like to do here, and we kind of didn't jump into it on the last little interview that we had, is um, what made you you? Me, me? I, I, I like to, the whole, the whole premise of Outside the Clutch is getting to know the people behind the brand. Oh. Oh, well, I've always kind of been this way. Everything you see now has been authentic my whole life. Um, wasn't really popular when I was a kid. High school, I was a little bitch. No <laughs> friends. Nerdy people picked on me. So I was forced to have a personality. And then I got good looking in my late 30s. Thanks. So, no, I don't know, man. I, um, I don't know. I've always been an animal guy. I've always been obsessed with all that stuff. And... Um, you know, growing up in Wisconsin, I did a lot of herping, mainly garter snakes, turtles, things like that. And I even grew up next to a pet store when I was five years old. All I do is walk across the driveway and I can spend all day in a pet store if I wanted to. And yeah, the, I don't know, I guess that aspect and personality wise, I think, um, I don't know, if people didn't like my shit so much, I might tone it down. But the thing is, I got a fan base now, so I just keep on pushing the envelope. But yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of little things, man. But, you know, I think Wisconsin and just kind of fishing and doing the outdoor thing by myself, not having a lot of friends, just kind of got me what I'm doing eventually. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you weren't working in reptiles, what do you think you'd be doing right now? Um, You know, that's a really tough one. Um, honestly, I've always uh, kind of been – I like helping people. So um, – you know, when I was in high school, I was actually talking to somebody about this a little earlier. Um, I did a lot of artwork, and the art wing was in the special ed wing. And we used to do a lot of projects with them and, you know, help out with those classes. And I always just enjoyed that. Um, so I had thought about maybe doing something with um, people care in general, anything like that. Um, I even think about it now, maybe going to an old folks somewhere once while I was talking to people, just like an hour or two a day for fun. But I don't know, man. I'm, I don't really know what I'm really qualified for. So I don't really know. I never really, I didn't go to school. I barely got through high school. I was always good at art. But it's tough to make a living being an artist. So I guess just anything in human services some way. I don't know. Do you think that's kind of how you have always connected with all the artists that kind of come in and out of the industry as well? I, um, you know, I was talking to Adeline and Chris about this. Um, you know, when Emily Burke came in the hobby, um, I loved her stuff. And that was right around the time that Pokemon Go was big and she was doing all the Pokemon designs. So I do think there is a draw for me for artists where I'm always attracted and wanted to talk to them, um, living vicariously through their lifestyle, essentially, because I just don't do anything anymore. But um, no, yeah, I've always really, um, yeah, you're right. I do gravitate towards artists. And you know, I was lucky enough with Emily back in the day. Um, she did a lot of custom designs for me that I did absolutely nothing with. And for a while, I was selling like her prints and stickers on my table at shows. And I take care of all the production stuff and all that. And I think it worked out for both of us, to tell you the truth. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. So you, you've had numerous years of experience in the industry. What's one of the things that shows that really sticks out to you every time? It shows? Um, you know, it's sad. I spend most of my time behind the table. I would say it used to be the animals. Um, can it be the food? Because I love it traveling. You know, yeah. You know, I, here's the thing. I am pretty simple. Um you know, when I'm on the road, I always look up diner driving knives. So I'm going to try to find some kind of unique meal to eat when I'm on the road. Um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, all my friends are pretty much reptile people. So, you know, I'm in Colorado next weekend. So I'll be able to see my friend Dave I haven't seen in a lifetime. Um, you know, honestly, just seeing the few people I don't get to see on the regular in their backyard. I find that always a lot of fun. Um, but no, for show stuff, I think it's really just the people. I mean, I generally, I, you know, it's get to see people I don't usually see and the food's a bonus too. And you, you've definitely had a vast influence on a lot of people that come through, like whether it's just kind of directing them with your animals, you know, or like bringing, bringing that admiration to animals in general. Like I've had the pleasure of actually watching you educate and do things of that nature. Who, who was that influence for you when you came in? Um, so the first person that, um, helped me when I got in the hobby was a Kenyan Sambo breeder in Buffalo, New York. His name was Ken Leach. 
Um, he worked at a pet store in my area called, started with an M. I'll remember it maybe. But, um, so I had always enjoyed the hobby, but I didn't know about the hobby. Like I knew you go to a pet store, you could buy a snake, whatever. I didn't know about snake shows, anything like that. So around the time I graduated in 2002, I was going to the pet store and Ken was telling me about the Cleveland shows and the White Plain shows and the Rochester shows and, you know, how you conduct yourself and how no price is a final price of a show, you know, make sure to negotiate and, you know, just kind of like the ropes a little bit. Uh, so that definitely helped out. Um, and then kind of along the way to, um, you know, for like the first five or six years, I worked underneath people kind of like at shows because shows have always been my thing to do i i don't i don't mind online sales but i love being at the shows like a traveling gypsy i say it all the time man i'm a gypsy buddy um but you know so like you know ken kind of helping out in the beginning kind of telling me a little bit about the hobby um you know from there when i moved to north carolina that was a big change for me my collection changed i started working with a guy named tim at the shows then i worked with a guy named skinny was a big fat jewish guy um and then i started to help limey um i don't know if you know who limey is so, I don't know him by his face, but I, I definitely yeah, know him. Right. So, um, you I know, know him by his tattoos. On his yeah, face. yeah, yeah. Um, so there was some, I don't exactly know who asked who or if I just imposed, but, you know, it got to the point where me and him were doing a show almost every weekend. Um, you, know, you know, I was doing all the heavy lifting, which I love doing. And really, that was probably one of the best things for me because um, he had a really wonderful collection, really good ball pythons. And then he also had all the Ractodactylus stuff. Um, you know, everyone's probably get Savannah's in every year to sell, but he always just had a very unique collection on the table. So it gave me an opportunity to be on that side of the table, talking to people about those animals, you know, essentially even learning myself as I was going. And I think those couple of years of helping out or however long that was made it so much easier when I had my first table and got out there and started doing it myself because it was all natural already. It was second nature, I guess you could say. Yeah. So we all go through kind of that one thing that may have been a barrier for some, but if you pursue this lifestyle, you have to make it through, right? What, what was that one thing when you were coming up, whether it be like a husbandry thing or like maybe maybe there was something in an initial breeding that kind of threw you off at first? Um, what, what was that like one moment that you really had to setback push moments? through? Yeah. Um, well, we all have setback moments. Um, so I'm going to I'll break it all down real fast, like the whole story. So when I got in the hobby, I was called the Noah's Ark guy because I bought a pair of everything. So I wanted everything out there. Very hard to be good at everything. Vin Russo is a couple guys that are just artists at this. They do really well. It's very hard to do a bunch of different species and be successful at it. So bows were always my niche. So essentially I had all this and then I dialed it down to boa constrictors. And then you, that was 2005, 2006, 2007. U.S. Sark was starting up in the Carolinas. The Lacey Act was coming up. Boas were on the list. I'm going to lose this. I'm going to lose that. I never had a lot of money. Um, I did factory work. I took that $100 extra I had on my check, and I saved it for a month until I had 400 bucks, and then I bought one snake at the show kind of thing. So, you know, all my decision-making had to be really good because I didn't have extra income if I made a bad decision. And then when things did go wrong, it didn't set me back a month or some of that years. Um so my big setback was I got really scared that my boas would not be what it would take to make a living or have something to do. So I got away from that and everyone was doing ball pythons. It was safe. I had an engineer friend, uh, my buddy, Ryan Moore. Um, you know, I talked to him about some stuff and, you know, I started building up some balls. Then I went to Daytona. When I came back, my whole collection was dead because the space heater overheated. So the one snake I bought to kind of finish up that was like, oh, it's gone. So then there was about a year or two of just, starting over again put in pennies dollars whatever i could back into it and um you know really the break was a display case where things started going really well for me when i started building acrylic display cases i was bartering for animals with them and i was also making pretty good money on it you know meeting a lot of people in the industry because i met chad hulker because of building display cases um through joe ellis so that was like the breaker where things really became more successful is when I had that outlet because it was financially helping me out. But um, yeah, really, you know, you hear about all these people, you lose everything and people just call it quits. It sucked. Um, just like this too much. Um, and the rebuild, you know, was a little more, um, more thought was put into it. 
you know, anybody who gets out of the hobby and comes back in always builds a better collection because you see what you made airs on in the first place and you do better the second time around. 100%. I get that. Yeah. Um, so going through that, and obviously anyone that's met you knows, like, this, this is your thing. Like, th there's... Not much you else. associate reptiles with Dave Levinson's name at this point, yeah. right? So what what's some advice that you would give to people that have that same drive, that same passion as you, that they literally want to make this their life? Um, well, I say the same thing to everybody. No unrealistic expectations. Don't count your clutches. Don't count the dollar amount. Ignore all that stuff. Um, you know, a lot of people come in here, and I think that's why partnerships don't work sometimes is one of the two people will never be happy. Um, and that's why most partnerships break up. Very few are very successful in this industry. Some do really well. Um, but I, again, no unrealistic expectations. And, you know, it's kind of a stupid thing to say, but if the dollar amount puts you into a species, this might not be for you in the first place. Um, you know, the money's great, I guess, but it, it's it's a burnout factor in this one. It's not going the way it is if that's your one fixation. Right. Um, you know, I always say that sometimes I have a challenge of making a nice ball python because I'm obsessed with boa constrictors. Um, but then when you go by my table, it kind of shows sometimes my work where we do have this fast ball python collection with all these ingredients and we could do almost anything we want. You go by our, the bows on the table and you kind of can see the development. You kind of see what was being worked on. So, you know, being passionate about it where you are going to pretty much obsess over it. The best people in this hobby are people who obsess over it. Um, when it is everything, it's everything. So you want to be good at it. So pick sign you love and make the best one you can possibly make. Sir, I love that. Um, so you've seen a lot of kind of ebbs and flows in your years. So this all comes in waves. Um, this industry is, it's, it's the same story over and over again. Um, and I've been a broken record. It's uh, probably people have heard me say what I'm about to say, but um, it wasn't just reptiles that surged during COVID. Plants surged during COVID. SPCA had record adoptions. Like, you can't even get a street cat. Um, so with that drive where everyone was doing hobby-based things at home, I think they were sold for a record amount of money during that time. Um, you know, it's just kind of what that trend was, like things that you could do for you, the idea of working from home. Um, a lot of people were buying homes outside of the city with an extra room to have an office or maybe a reptile room. Um so because we had that huge demand during COVID, prices went up because everything in this hobby is a supply and demand, of course. So, you know, I keep on saying the Mardi Gras ball python is my example. I talked to Josh at Ballshed about this. Mardi Gras ball pythons before COVID were $750. During COVID, they went up to $1,250. Now they're back down to $750. It's not so much that the market's worse. The demand is a little different and the supply is, I want to say, about the same in my opinion. Um, so what we had happen essentially was a correction on prices that inflated during COVID, but only on like some things because Woma pythons went from being what 150 bucks on male females to 650 to 850 female, and everybody wanted them. Um, Doomroll boas went from a hundred dollars to I heard off this twelve hundred dollars for some Doomroll boas. Argentine boas went up in price. A lot of shit did. Um, you're more like rare stuff. And I think the reason that that stuff went in is, you know, I find too, like with the new influencers that like with this bioactive kind of mindset, I find that, you know, people are anti ball. I need to have something else. Right. And, um, yeah, it's cool. That's why there's so much in this hobby. You can have the same thing you want. So, you know, like I said, really, this was just a supply and demand thing. I didn't see the price of women's or all that stuff come down through this and they're still selling like crazy. I just think there's some, like, it was my fault last Arlington. I didn't sell a ton of stuff, and I didn't understand why. Well, I didn't walk the show ahead of time, and I didn't realize that there was a readjustment at certain prices. So I still had a bunch of COVID prices on my table, and I think I was scaring people off because it looked like I was asking too much. But really, I just wasn't smart enough to check the market on certain things before a show because I didn't realize there was a change. And it almost felt like it happened overnight. Um, but no, have faith. I mean, the reality is you just might have to work a little bit harder, grind exactly. a little bit harder. I was going to say that, yeah. like, some of us, some of us aren't exactly showmen, but sometimes, sometimes to do it, you have to somewhat become a showman. Like be authentic to who you are, but yeah. don't don't be afraid to actually get out there and speak to people and interact. And I know when I first started and I first got behind tables, I was one of those where it was like, "Hey, how you doing?" 
if you want to see anything or you want to talk about something, let me know. Yeah. And now I'm actually, I'm getting myself to actually engage in conversations and like, well, let's talk about your project. So let's talk about this. Like actually bring them in and talk to them and let them know, Hey, I'm, I'm not just here to move an animal, but I want to like actually make sure you're growing in what you're doing. Well, I mean, good advice. Um, and you know, being your true self behind the table, um, you know, me, I, I know a little bit about a little bit of everything kind of thing. Like I, I, I love sports. I know a lot of sports facts. I know at least one sports fact about any team. And you know, like when it comes to like the sales aspect of things, like, you know, it's really just trying to connect to somebody. Somebody comes by my table, I'll key in on something and I'll bring up that one thing to start the conversation. Then I just sit back and listen. And that keeps them at the table a little longer. They're looking at the animals. Maybe they notice something they didn't notice. But, you know, you kind of have to just figure out what works for you. But, um, you know, my comment about being your true self or whatever, you know, it's really some people aren't complete on what it is for what this industry needs. Like, you know, not everybody has a personality where they're outgoing. Not everybody is a good breeder. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to find a person that some people are better on online sales and they hate going to shows and talking to people. Um, you know, you just got to find what works for you. If you come out here and be a fake version of yourself, it's probably going to affect your sales and the way you actually act with people. Um, with me, I'm a weirdo. I say whatever pops in my head. Sometimes it's bizarre. Sometimes I scare people away. Sometimes I don't. But um, yeah, man, once you figure out what that niche is that really works for you, maybe it's online sales. You know, maybe just simply emailing people is better than you actually having a conversation over the phone. Figure out what works and you can do your business that way. Um, there's people in this hobby that have been doing it for 20 years that have literally just ran a business online and have never even come to a show. So whatever works, works for you, man. So if there was one dream species that you could work with that you haven't been able to work with in your lifetime, what would that species be and why Why does it draw you the way that it does? Um, so I work with a lot of things I like already, to be honest with you. And I, uh, you know what? Amazon tree boas. What is it about ATVs? Well, they're so variable. Um, you know, I, I was looking at some old reptile magazines where I came out here from like the early 2000s and like 2011. And like some of the stuff that I'm like going crazy over now was done 10, 15, 20 years ago. And I feel like that's a species that, you know, you got your green tree python guys, you got your um, emerald tree boa guys. And then you got your Amazon guys. And um, because of that, you know, the people who have put the work in have done beautiful animals and have really taken projects to another level. So there is a potential there for line breeding that species when you key in on these little things that pop up, that you can clearly create something consistent. But again, it's the stepchild, man, of that community. And I think because of that, people don't mess with them. Me personally, I would love to have an entire wall unit of them, and I'd love to start working with some different library for that in the future. That was so. a that was a species I jumped into very early without knowing better. Yeah, uh, it, it was a very fun experience. Um, I bought a bunch from my local pet store because they had a set up in the corner, and they had like a one point two, and they had babies every year, and I always made sure to buy a baby. Um, but then when I changed my collection around to focus more on the boas, sold all that stuff to then. Be locked in on four snakes that I could try to make the future. Um, but no Amazons, man. I, I just think that's a species. I think any species come back and be popular at any point. Um, blue tongue skinks were nothing until they were something because Barchak talked about them on snake bites. And they went from being a $75 to $100 pet to $450 for a classic. And, you know, the, that community too, like, you know, that community was really booming when we had all these new people in it because. Well, you and I might pair, somebody else might not. And when they did things that we wouldn't do, they did things that we had never seen before that I wouldn't even have thought of. Um, I'm not going to tell you some of my secrets of what I want to do in the future with those guys, but I think there's certain things because of what I saw other people do those four or five years that gave me ideas of what I'm doing with my collection right now. So, you know, more the merrier. I think when people get drawn into a species, we all start breeding Wilmas now. We're starting to see some really quality Wilmas. Mike had his really nice black stuff he was producing. Talked to a guy at the bar last night. He was showing me these really nice pastel, like olive green and yellow ones he had, reduced pattern ones. Um, yeah, I think Amazons, man. I, I want Amazons to be a thing. And I, I think they're really easy. You know, I never had to scent the babies. Um, you know, you can keep them in colonies. They're going to breed just fine. I think they're. Uh, I think it might be something fun for me to do, maybe sooner than I want. I don't know. So all of us should strive to kind of 
push the industry forward in some way or form. What would you like to see change in the industry to kind of better it and propel it towards the future? Um, you know, I don't know if I have one thing right now because in all honesty, I do think that the hobby as a whole has been striving in the right direction. Like strides going forward. Like, you know, I was even talking like display cases, you know, you used to come to the shows and everyone had like, dinky this and dinky that and they just put them in these scuffed up containers and they might have a banner now people haven't even read a snake yet already buying banners they're buying display cases buy matching tablecloths so i think the professionalism has definitely gone way up in the hobby which helps out i think everything um i think the bioactive movement is a really good thing for the hobby it put isopods on the map man like it created an entire industry because of that one industry which i love um I don't know what to say right now to do that's going to really take us to the next step just because everybody right now, in my opinion, is doing more than I've ever seen before. And until we figure out what that new thing is that we all have to start doing with social media or another platform, whatever else, I don't really see – I don't I don't have any criticisms or anything I'd see that have to change right now. I, I see a lot of things that are in a positive direction right now for the hobby. That's, yeah. that's a great perspective. I mean, you, you have the time behind it, so – uh, like I'm always, I'm, I'm nitpicky on like my husbandry and stuff like that. Right. So it's, I'm always trying to take a different angle from it and learn from the bioactive guys or learn from the old school way of how they did things and just kind of, I don't know. I'm very much so take the old with the new and find a way to converge it. But that's always been my mindset. Um, which, so I, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying it. we're in a great place. I, I full or wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, it's always a perspective I like to Yeah, catch, no, know. and like I said, I wish there was like something like, you know, like stickers. I, Quit doing stick- stickers. No, stickers. Oh, stickers, man. That's a sticker, sticker trend. Swappers. I've never printed a no, sticker yet. I'm going to probably print a sticker. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I gave you one. You didn't have to give me one back. I give them to my customers. Right. Oh, uh, so no, that's great, though. Um, if we we want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Um. Oh, man, I'm hard to get a hold of. Um, here's the thing. I, I don't do a lot on social media other than my personal page occasionally. My phone number is one eight 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 reptile So you can always call that number. Um, but no, I mean, on social media, I should probably start checking it a little more. Um, that's something that, um, you know, we had the Instagram page that Ben had, and I took it over after he passed away. And we got up to like 48,000 or 40-something thousand followers. And then it got hacked, and I lost everything. And it literally took the wind out of my sails. All his old content was on there. I took screenshots as I was watching it get deleted and they wouldn't do anything. I haven't even fully committed to um, anything social media since that happened. And that shit was like two and a half years ago. Or maybe it was two years ago. Um, so that's one thing I'm definitely going to have to work a little harder on. I, I completely forgot. Oh, so that was me telling you that I'm on social media, but I don't check it enough. If you hit me up on there, you'll find me. Um, again, my phone number, I might not answer the phone every time because I live in the middle of nowhere, but I'll always text back. Um, and weekends i'm always in the car on friday driving to a show so if there's any time i got time to burn where i'm not working on some animal stuff call me on friday or sunday that's gonna be the best thing awesome. um yeah i don't know man we'll do this again a little more longer yeah. i got a lot more stuff i'd like to talk to you about of course absolutely but, thanks again yeah, brother of course have fun man